Greetings, everyone. Hope all of you are having an absolutely fantastic day today. Want to get into Wrath of the Righteous and start doing some party member builds. One of my personal favorite party members is Sila, so I figured why not start with her. Her base class is Paladin. She's human. Okay, this is the first place where things are going to be a little bit different. Um, we're going to try to get her base stats at cl as close to what it is in the actual game. But unfortunately, Sela is one of a couple of party members who have base stats that cannot be replicated by you in the mercenary creation or even in regular character creation. So her strength, when you first get her, she's level one, her strength is 18 her dexterity is 13, her constitution is 14, and her wisdom is 13. Unfortunately, as you can see, there's no way for me to be able to replicate that. So it doesn't really affect our ability to go through these levels and show you how to build her out as a paladin, but I just want to make sure you can note that. I put the 13 in dexterity because that is necessary in order for us to pick dodge, which is one of the feats that is chosen in our first level. Another difference, building this paladin up as a mercenary, I get three skill points. Sila only gets two skill points. And also for some reason, she gets three skill points on her very first level. So she has a two in persuasion and a one in world knowledge. Whereas it, it seems like she should have only had two. So um, just to keep with the way she is when you get her, we'll just go ahead and put one in persuasion, one in world, and we'll just throw one in religion. Next, okay, so she has dodge. Then we get extra feet for being human, I believe, and hers is in shield focus. She doesn't have a background we can select, so I choose none here. Ioma Day is her deity. Of course, she's lawful good. We won't mess around with appearance. We'll make female pious. And Sila 2. Okay. And that's about as close as we can get to Sela's base stats. All right. Now, continue on. Paladin level two. So, again, I'll say this for the last time. And when you're actually leveling Sela, you'll only get um, two points, not the three that we're getting here. And I would, I personally stick with perception because perception is great with <laughs> just about anyone. There are some instances where it's useful to have multiple party members with decent perception level stats. Um, and then from there, you can choose either, I would go either religion or world. I think I usually choose religion, but it depends on what your team actually needs, of course. All right. So then she gets lay on hands at level two, and that's uh, basically a healing option that paladins get. And we're going to be able to level that up in different ways as we go along. And then she gets divine grace. A paladin gains a bonus equal to her charisma bonus, if any, on all saving throws. All right. And paladin level three. So we get another feat. I go ahead, scroll all the way down to the bottom and get weapon focus and then long sword. She's sword and board when you first get her. I see no reason to switch that up. So mercy, air, they are different ways that your lay on hands can be changed as you level up. So basically, instead of just healing, it'll also alleviate other potential symptoms that your party members are experiencing. I find it best to try to pick symptoms that they might be dealing with after a fight has been finished. In the middle of the fight, Sela is your tank. She's up front. She might be surrounded. You're not going to have her running back and forth, laying hands on people to try to heal them and, and clear whatever they have going on. But once a fight has been finished, if they still have lingering issues that need to be cleared, it's useful to have a paladin that can assist with that. So because of that, out of this list, I would go with fatigued. Sickened and shaken usually have very short durations like 20 seconds where you'll just go ahead and wait it out and won't uh, waste an, uh, an ability usage in order to clear them. Whereas fatigued, a lot of times if it's on, it stays on. 
All right, and at third level, she gets divine health. A paladin is immune to all diseases, including supernatural and magical diseases, including mummy rot. And she gets aura of courage. A paladin is immune to fear, magical or otherwise. Each ally within 10 feet of her gains a plus four morale bonus on saving throws against fear effects. Next. All right, now you are at level four and you can choose which attribute you want to level up. It's really between charisma or strength. Now, charisma, its modifiers, as you've already seen, affect some of the abilities that Paladin has. It also affects how many spell slots a Paladin has. But I would say that your Paladin, they're not ever going to get to that point where they have enough slots that they're just flinging spells around everywhere and you could just use them mainly as a spellcaster. Most of their slots are probably going to be dedicated to buffs and then they're going to be charging straight in and swinging that sword left and right. So I would say you should be leveling up strength, but you could do whatever you feel like works best for you. All right. And then perception. And she gets an additional smite evil usage. So once per day, a paladin can call out to the powers of good to aid her in her struggle against evil. As a swift action, the paladin chooses one target within sight to smite. If the target is evil, the paladin adds a charisma bonus, if any, to her attack rolls and adds a paladin level to all damage rolls made against the target of her smite. Smite evil attacks automatically bypass any damage resistance the creature might possess. In addition, while Smite Evil is in effect, the Paladin gains a deflection bonus equal to her Charisma modifier, if any, to her AC against attacks made by the target of the Smite. If the Paladin targets a creature that is not evil, the Smite is wasted with no effect. Very, very good stuff. And she also gets the ability to channel positive energy to heal allies or to damage undead. Again, very useful. All right, and we get another feat. And now that we have the ability to channel energy, you wanna go ahead and, and you select a channel. Whenever you channel positive energy to heal the living or channel negative energy to heal the undead, you do not affect enemies. When you channel positive energy to damage undead or channel negative energy to damage living, you do not affect allies. Basically ensuring that you will always hit who you, exactly who you mean to hit. You also get to choose a divine bond, either a weapon or a pet. So let's go over the weapon. Upon reaching level five, a paladin forms a divine bond with her weapon. As a standard action, she can call upon the aid of a celestial spirit for one minute per paladin level. The spirit grants the weapon a plus one enhancement bonus, which increases as she continues to level up. That's cool and all, but in my mind, there is absolutely no question you want to go with uh, the uh, Mount Bond. A paladin gains the service of an unusually intelligent, strong, and loyal steed to serve her in her crusade against evil. This mount is a heavy horse. This mount functions as a druid's animal companion, using the paladin's level as her effective druid level. Pets are amazing, amazing as tanks, amazing as additional damage dealers, amazing as creatures you could just throw out there and get the fight started before some of your squishies get in the mix. They're just awesome. So I would recommend you go for the mount. Right now in the beta, they only have the Smolodin available as the Paladin pet mount. If you choose a different class that has a uh, the ability to select an animal earlier, they get the full selection. I don't know if that's just because we're in the beta or if that's by design that Paladins can only choose Smolodins, which I don't remember being the case in Kingmaker, but it's the case right now, and Smolodins are absolutely fantastic, so it's not like you're really being shorted. All right, in level six, you get a mercy option once again. I like uh, choosing diseased. Um, diseases oftentimes can have long durations, where, and they can be difficult to take off. Treat affliction fails all the time, so... 
it's good having this only on hands. Level seven. Okay, I like to get Boon Companion here. I don't know why the game gives you a thumbs down for this and says that you shouldn't select it, but to me, it's a no brainer. The abilities of your animal companion are calculated as though your class were four levels higher to a maximum effective level equal to your character level. More than likely, when you choose this at level seven, when you come out of the level up menu, you're going to see your, pan, your pet grow exponentially. Um, they... They basically reach a certain level. I think it might be like eight, something like that. But they basically get to a certain level and then they'll grow much larger and be significantly more powerful. And that's obviously what you want. So I would say go for Boon Companion. Absolutely. And like always, we'll go over the Paladin's powers at the end of the video. So I can tell you what are a few of them that I feel like are definitely stand out. Increased strength, skills, aura resolve. At 8th level, a paladin is immune to charm spells and spell-like abilities. Each ally within 10 feet of her gains a plus 4 morale bonus on saving throws against charm effects. I forgot to mention, with that aura of courage you get around level 3, that thing basically makes you immune to fear until you hit around, I'd say, level 9 or 10. Up until then, I never had to worry about any creature's fear being able to pierce through that aura. It's not until then that you need to start, again, using effects that'll protect you from fear. All right, level 9. And critical, improve critical. Long sword, she will do major damage with that sword. So absolutely, you want to go ahead and invest in that. And I would say exhausted, exhausted or cursed, either one of them. In fact, I might, I might say go with cursed. Be, being cursed, so annoying in this game. So annoying. All right, and level 10. She's got some more spells. Level 11. And I went, let me just make sure, right. I went with critical, where is it? Critical focus. Great focus. Oh, I should know. There are uh, quite a few people who swear by dazzling display. And of course, Sela starts off with a couple of points in the persuasion skill. So you could easily go that route. Dazzling display while wielding a weapon in which you have weapon focus, you can perform a bewildering show of prowess as a full round action. Make a persuasion intimidate check to demoralize all foes within 30 feet who can see your display. You can absolutely go this route. I don't use Sela's crowd control. I use her to kind of throw her in there and let her draw in all of the damage and nasty spells while she's hacking away at enemies. And that's pretty much my focus. But you can absolutely go this route if you so choose. I prefer critical focus here. You are trained in the art of causing pain. You receive a plus four circumstance bonus on attack rolls made to confirm critical hits. And then you get at 11th level, a paladin can expend two uses of her smite evil ability to grant the ability to smite evil to all allies for one minute using her bonuses. As a swift action, the paladin chooses one target within sight to smite. If the target is evil, the paladin's allies add her charisma bonus, if any, to their attack rolls and add her paladin level to all damage rolls made against the target of her smite. Smite evil attacks automatically bypass any damage resistance the creature might possess. Cool stuff. In addition, the your pet gains a celestial creature's simple template. What does that mean? Have absolutely no clue. It's not in the beta. Uh, a lot of the stuff around the pets is not complete in the beta. You should be able to actually mount them and go into combat. That's not ready yet. So couldn't tell you what that means, but I'm sure it's awesome. Oh, 
No, all right. And then you can choose between exhausted and paralyzed. I would say if you're if you're exhausted, more than likely you're just going to go ahead and rest. So I'm gonna go with paralyzed. Paralyzed is another one of those. Well, actually, paralyzed or I would actually go with blinded. Blinded happens a lot more than paralyzed, even though paralyzed is absolutely annoying as hell. I would say go with blinded here. So here you get a couple of critical options that you can choose between. I know one of them is tiring critical, right? Tiring critical, staggering critical, and sickening critical. I thought there was one more. Nope, guess not. So out of these, I usually take sickening critical, but you can take whichever one you want. Mind you, you can only have one. So whenever you score a critical hit, your opponent becomes sickened for one minute. The effects of this feat do not stack. Additional hits instead add to the effects duration. You can only apply the effects of one critical feat to a given critical hit unless you possess critical mastery, which I don't believe paladins get. So we'll go with sickening critical. and aura of faith. At 14th level, a paladin's weapons are treated as good aligned for the purposes of overcoming damage reduction. Any attack made against an enemy within 10 feet of her is treated as good aligned for the purposes of overcoming damage reduction. Good stuff. Ah yeah, blinding critical. That's the one that I didn't see last time. Or maybe you have to wait until, right, your, maybe your attack bonus has to be at a certain level before this will pop up for you, but it's another option. Um, so here, I feel like you have two things that you can kind of choose between. You have Hammer the Gap. You repeatedly strike the same location, causing increasing amounts of damage. When you make a full attack, each consecutive hit against the same opponent deals extra damage equal to the number of previous consecutive hits you have made against that opponent this turn. Damage is multiplied on a critical hit. It's cool. But you shouldn't be hitting enemies that often. So that's why I didn't choose it earlier. But it's it's perfectly acceptable at this point. Or what I like to do is give her a little bit more protection. You become proficient with tower shields. Some of the late game tower shields are actually really, really nice. So I like going ahead and throwing this on her. And then with Mercy... Um, you could choose paralyzed or confused as something that lasts oftentimes after you've come out of combat. And again, I, you know, a confused last, uh, confused happens to you much more often than paralyzed. So I'd probably go with that. At least in the beta, it does. And you get some more spell resistance. A paladin's mount gains spell resistance equal to the paladin's level plus 11. Awesome. 16, 17, what just happened? Oh, this one, there we go. All right, and now might as well go ahead and get Hammer the Gap. And you get Aura of Righteousness. A paladin gains damage resistance five evil and immunity to compulsion spells and spell-like abilities. Each ally within 10 feet of her gains a plus four morale bonus on saving throws against compulsion effects. All right, now that we've gone through the actual levels, let's go through the mythic path. So first one, I feel like you should scroll down here and get leading strike. Your strikes make cracks in the enemy existence, leaving weak points for your allies to strike. Every time you hit a target in melee combat, you leave a mark on it. Any ally attacking the mark target deals additional divine damage equal to 1d6 per mythic rank to the target, consuming the mark. You should be constantly swinging that sword, so this goes right in line with that. Next, Destructive Shockwave. Whenever you miss with a melee attack, the target still takes damage equal to your strength bonus. This damage cannot be increased by any other means. So... Every single time, she's constantly going to be swinging that sword. And every single time she swings that sword, she's going to do damage, at the very least, her whatever her strength bonus is, 
and she's going to leave a mark on that enemy, which will allow additional damage to be done. At this time, 2d6, and it will consistently increase over the, the course of your playthrough. Good stuff, in my opinion. All right, next. I would go ahead and get Last Stand. Your mission is too important to fall in battle, and your mythic powers let you endure unbelievable things. Once per day, when your HP drops low, you become unkillable. For two rounds, you become immune to damage that would make you unconscious. For the most part, you should be buffing your party and you'll have healers, so sealer really shouldn't go down. But there are definitely some fights where large bursts of damage are, are virtually unavoidable. Like it's just going to happen and then you've got to just rush and deal with it. So having something like this that absolutely ensures no matter what, Sela is going to keep standing and keep doing whatever it is you need her to do. To me, it helps quite a bit. All right. Now down here, I would go for shield focus mythic. Add your shield bonus and your shields enhancement bonus to your touch AC. Your touch AC is going to uh, be the hardest AC for you to level up. So this is actually a significant bonus to hard defensive capabilities. And you choose this later on because later on things get harder. And so it becomes harder to keep all your people standing up. All right. And we get another mythic ability. And this time I would choose mythic beast. Your animal companion gains a bonus to its strength, dexterity, and constitution equal to half your mythic rank plus one. Its attack now ignore damage reduction except for N minus, whatever that is. Um, so I would say definitely this is worth taking. And so by this time you're level five, so you think it's going to get a plus two increase to, on strength, dexterity, and constitution? Well worth it. And one more time. All right, next up, you could choose Mythic Channeling if you're the type who is using her ability to channel energy a lot. When you channel energy, the damage you heal or deal increases by a number of points equal to twice your Charisma bonus. So that's an option. Otherwise, I would go for Improved Critical and just choose your uh, Longsword. Your Critical Strikes with your Chosen Weapon are deadlier than most. Your Critical Multiplier with your Chosen Weapon is increased by one. And there you go. Um, I feel like that really sets you up for success. If we look at the spell book, uh, we're going to go through it. So you'll see, even though I didn't put mythic talents into increasing her spell slots, she does still get a decent number. Um, out of this first level, I would say Veil of Heaven is definitely a standout. For the duration of this spell, you gain a plus two sacred bonus to AC and on saves. Both of these bonuses apply only against attacks or effects created by outsiders with the evil subtype. You could dismiss the spell as a swift action to deal 1d8 points of damage plus one point per paladin level to all such outsiders within five feet. Definitely something I consistently keep on her. And Veil of Positive Energy is the same thing, I think, but except it applies specifically to undead creatures. So if you know you're facing undead, this can be a good thing to have around. Um, of course, Magic Weapon is also very good. Magic Weapon gives a, a weapon a plus one enhancement bonus on attacks and damage rolls. So you're going to level out of that at some point. But when you're first starting, definitely useful. The rest of this, I feel like it's probably more so covered in other classes. And so I don't feel like it's essentially all that great for her. Protection from Chaos and Evil is fantastic, but you should be using the communal version that affects all your party, not just your paladin. For our level two, speaking of that communal version, protection from chaos and evil uh, is very useful, especially if you don't have access to this from your cleric. Um, remove paralysis. Like I said, paralysis is extremely annoying when it happens. So you should hopefully have a cleric or some scrolls that will allow you to take that off. But if you don't, it's good to have it here. Um, and Aura of Greater Courage. When you cast this spell, you strengthen your Paladin's Aura of Courage. Until the end of its duration, 
All allies within that aura are immune to fear. If you do not have the aura of courage class feature, aura of greater courage has no effect, but of course you do. So this is very useful. Like I said, uh, levels, you know, three till nine, you won't really need it. But once you hit above 10 and start facing some of the tougher enemies, they'll be able to slice through just the regular aura. You're going to need to use this. Level three, angelic aspect. You take on an aspect of an angelic being, including some of its physical characteristics. You gain resistance to acid and cold and damage resistance towards evil. You also gain a plus two deflection bonus to AC and a plus two resistant bonus on saves against attacks made or effects created by evil creatures. In addition, your natural weapons and any weapons you wield are considered good aligned for the purpose of overcoming damage reduction. Very, very nice. Um, there are other nice things as well. Delay poison is also clearly awesome. Resist energy is awesome. Dispel magic. All of these I feel like should kind of be covered in your other classes. Prayer is definitely useful as well. Your cleric should have that. Greater ma magic weapon is also something that should be consistently on her. This spell functions like magic weapon, except that it gives a weapon an enhancement bonus on attack and damage rolls of plus one per four caster levels. This bonus does not allow a magic to bypass damage reduction aside from magic. Um, so definitely this is something you want to have on, on her. But again, like so sale, he's the one usually that I have placing on her. I usually don't use one of her, splot, uh, her slots. Um, to put that on. Archon's Aura is also very nice. You gain a powerful aura, similar to an Archon's Aura of Menace. Any hostile creature within a 20-foot radius of you must succeed at a will save to resist the effects of this aura. If the creature fails, it takes a negative two penalty on attack rolls and saving throws and to armor class for the duration of this spell or until it successfully hits you with an attack. A creature that has resisted or broken the effect cannot be affected again by this particular casting of Archon's Aura. So, um, again, that is very nice, especially for someone who's going to be in the thick of it and is more than likely their aura will hit everyone. But it's also a situation where I feel like a cleric could kind of take on that role. So sales should have access to Archon's Aura. So you can decide what works for you. And then finally, level four, Angelic Aspect Greater. So now this spell functions like Angelic Aspect, except you gain damage resistance 10 towards evil, immunity to acid and cold, resistance to electricity and fire 10, plus four racial bonus on saves against poison, and protective aura as a supernatural ability for the duration of the spell. Protective aura provides a plus four deflection bonus to AC, and a plus four resistant bonus on saving throws against attacks made or effects created by evil creatures to anyone within 20 feet. Otherwise, it functions as a magic circle against evil and a lesser globe of invulnerability, both with a radius of 20 feet. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Um, and that is the main thing that I'll probably use from here. You can you can throw on Shield of Dawn. Any creature that strikes you with a melee attack deals normal damage, but also takes 1d6 points of fire damage, plus one point per caster level, maximum of 15. Creatures with reach weapons are not subject to this damage if they attack you. Um, but honestly, you're only going to have a couple of slots. I would say all of them should go to Angelic Aspect Greater. Also notice that most of the buffs she uses, they're one minute per level. So it's absolutely going to be worth your while as you get to further mythic levels to choose the options that allow your buffs to last up to 24 hours. Um, I don't choose that for the first couple of them because, again, we want to get the most out of her swinging that sword and being a tank. But at this point, you're going to be able to just do whatever you want with the mythic options. So I would say go for that. Being able to have on Angelic Aspect for 24 hours would be, of course, be really, really nice. And so finally, if we go ahead and take a look at my Sela that I have built up, just to give you an idea what to focus on. Like I said, manually, I focus on strength and then I just pick the best headband I have to level up her charisma um, for cape. 
uh, you get the best um, cloak of resistance that you can, best ring of protection that you can. Um, I found a, a ring, or I think I bought this ring that adds some more to our smite ability. Best army, heavy armor you can, of course. And then for your necklace, usually I would use um, the best one that gives you a natural armor bonus. And of course, sword and shield. She's been absolutely fantastic. Uh, really no complaints about her whatsoever. She does her job. And that's the build. So what do you think? Is Sela someone who you plan to use when you do your first run through with Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous? Let me know down in the comments and leave me a like if you enjoyed this video. Appreciate you all and I'll see you in the next video later this week. Take care.